Look at that. We didn't, we, we didn't even have to say a word. And there's this, it must be my Steve Jobs outfit this, this morning. <laughs> Wanted to thank you all for, for coming back. Um, I hope the Summer Institute Many of you got to see that and, and enjoyed it. That was fun, right? And we're excited to have Alex Prudhomme and Beth Gardner here. And I'm just going to do a little introduction of Beth, who is our interlocutor and my boss, which is always a great thing. <laughs> Beth is the board chair here at the College of the Atlantic. She hails from London. It's a wonderful family, some of whom are here today. Um, she did her undergraduate degree at Duke University and then had a long, excellent um, experience in broadcast journalism with NBC. Um, and the, the most amazing story I, I love about Beth is that then she developed this passion for ceramics um, and really looked into how do we understand the world by looking at the movement of ceramics across Asia um, and in the Indian Ocean. And her most recent research is focused on the shipwreck from 1558 called Espadarte, which is swordfish in Portuguese. Um, and she has developed this incredible expertise. She went on to get her master's degree from the Sotheby Institute in, in London. And so she is really a preeminent human ecologist because she, she manages this massive range of human experience. And um, I've learned so much from working closely with Beth. And Beth, thank you so much for all you do for the college. And thank you for being here to talk with Alex. Take it on. Thanks very much, Darren. Welcome, everybody. Um, glad to see you all here on a rainy, gray May morning. I wanted to introduce, introduce first, before we begin, Alex Prudhomme. Um, Alex is a journalist and a writer who has been published widely. He's written books on terrorism, biotech, the fate of fresh water, hydrofracking. But today, he's with us to talk to us about food, and specifically about food and the White House, and how food can be used as political capital. His newly published book is called Dinner with the President. And I imagine, but I haven't actually had the chance to ask him yet, that he is a real foodie. He was probably a foodie long before the term was coined. That's because he's the grand nephew of Julia Child, the famous chef with whom he was very close. He's commented that he was raised in a family of cooks where history and politics were often debated at the table. And that led him almost inevitably to write this book. Back in 2004, Alex co-wrote My Life in France with Julia Child, which I read myself many years ago. And now I honestly can't believe my good luck that I was offered uh, the, the position to, or the job to be the interlocutor today. I loved that book in particular so much that I, in London, where I live, I spread it far and wide. Um, so who are America's gastro diplomats? Why was the bicentennial state dinner in 1976 at the White House in honor of the Queen of England such a disaster? We're about to find out. Alex and I had a chat ahead of this talk about how we could best map out and share with you some of the highlights of his book. You'll see that he's a wonderful storyteller. We decided to walk through Alex's book chronologically, and you'll notice as the years progress how each administration begins to hone their soft power skills of using food as a political tool. So let's dive in. John Adams, we're going to start with the second president of the United States, president from 19, uh, 1797 to 1801. And from what I understand from reading Alex's book, he was a frugal Yankee intellectual. So what does he have to do with food? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, great turnout on a rainy morning. Thank you, Beth, for that lovely introduction. Um, our family has a long history in Mount Desert. 
and uh, we've had many uh, visitations to College of the Atlantic, and it's great to see the college doing so well, this beautiful new building, and all of you supporting programming. Um, John Adams, second president, was a frugal Yankee uh, who hailed from Quincy, Massachusetts, where um, frugality was a paramount virtue. And uh, he survived on uh, cod cakes. Uh, he uh, liked to have a tankard of uh, hard cider every morning for breakfast to get the engine running. Um, but uh, he was not a foodie. And when he was the first president to live in the White House, George Washington planned the White House, cited it, but never lived there. And sometimes in presidential history, you'll, you'll find that there is a man who is fated for a job that he is ill-suited for. John Adams was such a man. He uh, moved in in uh, 1800, and Abigail Adams, his wife, uh, preferred to stay on the family farm in Quincy. She didn't really want to take the long and arduous carriage trek down to Washington City, as it was called, uh, which took many days and was uncomfortable. So John Adams moves into the White House, and he arrives and discovers that it's only half built. There's a beautiful ionic columns, a set of columns and the, the front steps, uh, but then he gets inside and the floors aren't finished. Um, the walls, which have been plastered with a combination of horse hair, hog hair, uh, and beer, uh, so there's a, a food stuff baked into the White House wall, uh, <laughs> were still curing, and they had 39 fireplaces, which were all ablaze, trying to dry out the walls as he came in. Um, no indoor plumbing. There was an outhouse. The, the grounds, so-called, were a bunch of scrub brush, uh, some old kilns, and a little garden. Uh, and there were vagrants living on the grounds. And Washington City was a real backwater. So he moves into this enormous half-built house. The city itself is half-built. Um, and it was all, and democracy was a, a work in progress in those days. And uh, he's lonely. And he sends these plaintive letters up to Quincy, begging Abigail to come down and keep him company. And eventually she succumbs and comes down. And she starts to turn this shell of a house into a home. They quickly discover that the few residents of Washington City have social aspirations. And they, they basically demand that uh, the First Lady host a series of parties. And she quickly found herself having to give up to 15 parties a day at the half-finished White House, um, which was then called the President's House, the President's Mansion. Um, and she, as a first lady in those days, was known as Mrs. Presidentress. Um, <laughs> so you see, this was all a work in progress. Um, and she uh, and, and John would really prefer to stay at home and read a book in front of the fire and, and talk about uh, their, uh, their family. Uh, their son was an alcoholic. They were worried about him. Uh, she had some ill health. They really didn't want to be socialites. And yet they were fated to, to host the opening party at the White House. The social pressure continued to build. The, the public wanted an opening party. And uh, Abigail resisted. Uh, she said, oh, my china was broken or stolen on the way down to Washington. I'm not ready yet. Uh, she stalled. She stalled. And finally, New Year's Day of 1801, they opened the People's House, so-called, to the people for the first time. Um, What's interesting about this social pressure is it's almost a biological imperative. When I was researching this book, I discovered that there is a deep desire for us human beings to eat together. Um, not only uh, is it something that we enjoy doing, but we almost have to do it. Uh, there, it when we eat together as a community, it releases endorphins, which are the feel-good chemicals that encourage us to repeat good behavior. And it's essentially a survival tool. And it's, as, as it's akin to when primates groom each other. These endorphins are released. It makes us feel good. Um, the other aspect of this is that traditionally, the table has been a place where uh, it's considered a neutral space. You put your weapons aside. You break bread together. Uh, you have frank conversations off the record. You broker deals and treaties and marriages. 
and you get to know, leaders get to know each other as human beings as opposed to just stick figures. And so the table becomes a, a place where people can meet and communicate that's sort of outside the normal channels. So there's all this pressure for the Adamses to host this party, and they finally give in. New Year's Day, they have this party. It's a lunch, not a dinner. And the other thing that's going on in the background is that Thomas Jefferson is the vice president. Now, he's a very different character. He's somebody who loved to give parties. Uh, he had his wonderful um, estate at Monticello, and if you've never been there, I highly recommend it with its wonderful gardens. He also um, had been ambassador to Paris, and he had brought his slave chef, James Hemings, with him and trained him in some of Paris's best kitchens. And James Hemings and Thomas Jefferson together created what became known as Virginia cuisine or Jefferson's table, which is essentially the beginnings of uh, the American cuisine, American cookery, which is a fusion of indigenous American ingredients like corn and cod, uh, venison, um, and uh, French technique, cooking technique, British recipes, some of the herbs and spices that the slaves brought from Africa, and then a soupçon of their own inspiration. And this combined, so Jefferson had the vision for this cuisine. Uh, Hemings was able to execute it ex excellently. They brought back from France some exotic things like macaroni um, and vanilla ice cream, uh, which Americans had never heard of. And, and a special meal, I, I opened the book with a special meal that, that Jefferson held um, uh, for Madison and Hamilton, where he brokered a piece over a dinner. And the kicker was this exotic dessert of cold ice cream served in a warm puff pastry, which kind of blew everybody's mind. Of course, all of his French wine and brandy didn't hurt either. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Adamses are in the White House, and they're looking at some of their Southern colleagues, like Jefferson and Madison, who were slaveholders, who came from these plantations where they had this incredible bounty, and they would hold, hold these exotic dinners with you know, 12 or 15 courses, beautiful wines. The Adamses were relatively uh, poor Yankee farmers who would serve a little bit of mutton, uh, some bacon, uh, a few vegetables, a couple of tankards. Uh, so they, they couldn't really compete socially and they didn't want to spend the money either. Um, they were frugal. So they hold this luncheon, which is really not even lunch. It's um, a, a series of sweets, of desserts, um, coffee, tea, and then some lightly alcoholic punch. <laughs> and, and yet it satisfies the public craving for an opening party. Um, and then what happens is that uh, uh, Jefferson, the vice president, and Adams's former good friend, turns against him, wins the election, uh, becomes the next president. And Adams is so put out by this that they, they flee at dawn before the inauguration, so they don't have to be subjected to the humiliation of being there. And they're sitting up in Quincy, and they're looking at what's happening in Washington. And with sort of a mix of, of, of disgust, but also envy, um, Adams looks at, at, at the, the fabulous parties that Jefferson's holding every night at the, at, the, at the White House. And he says, you know, I gave a, a party once a week or maybe once every two weeks. Jefferson's doing this every day. And uh, he starts listing off the foods that, that Jefferson has. And he's kind of mystified, but I think a little bit envious. I think he realized that maybe he had missed an opportunity. So this is one of the foundational stories um, of the White House and its food. It's the first party. Um, it's hosted by a man who's ill-suited for the job. And, and yet it becomes, uh, it's sort of opening day. And from then on, the White House becomes a platform for politics and socializing and American culture writ large. So great. You can see all the incredible detail with which Alex um, writes about in every chapter. I mean, that, that is just literally the top of the iceberg. Um, so we decided in our, when we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago, that we would then skip ahead to the 34th president of the United States, who's Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was president from 1953 to 1961. As you know, he was a five-star general. And this you probably didn't know, because I didn't know it. He was a real foodie. 
and he's an accomplished cook. So Ike Eisenhower, as he was known, was his nickname, uh, was one of these guys who I thought I knew. He uh, always appeared to me as a black and white figure, five-star general, kind of square-shaped head, uh, a rigorous man, but also uh, an exemplar of the 1950s. His wife, Mamie, reveled in being a housewife and a mother, and uh, they lived a very seemingly conventional life. And when I was re researching this book, I discovered that pretty much every president had a fabulous food story, and I had to decide who to use and who not to use. I ended up writing about 26 presidents, and the hard part was deciding who to include and who not to include. And I came to Eisenhower, and I thought, well, this guy, he's a general, how interesting can he be? Well, lo and behold, uh, he turns out to be one of my favorite presidents. He's really interesting and not black and white, but really polychromatic. Um, his mother was a pacifist. His father worked at a dairy. He was born in Texas, raised in Kansas as a farm boy, uh, had a bunch of brothers. Uh, one, one of the ways he learned to cook was he was schooled by an illiterate woodsman who taught him to hunt and fish and how to cook. And Ike became the family cook. He would cook for his brothers and his mother. Uh, he loved to catch trout and he would roll them in cornmeal and cook them in bacon grease, or he would hunt for grouse um, or venison. Uh, there's some terrific stories I tell. One of my favorites is he's out camping with a bunch of his friends as a kid and they run out of food, so they shoot some squirrel and they have a little bit of leftover potatoes and he makes a, a squirrel stew. Uh, but he tells his other friends that it's crow stew and they think, oh, that doesn't sound so good. So he and his compatriot uh, had the lion's share of the stew. And that shows you he's a little bit of a game player from early on. He's thinking strategically, right? <laughs> um, and he was one of the last presidents to have squirrel stew. Uh, but squirrel stew is one of the dishes that we used to eat, uh, along with things like roasted possum, turtle soup, things that are no longer in vogue, but that were considered the height of fine dining back in the day. Um, and so when Eisenhower was a general during the Second World War, he was put in charge of the Allied forces in Europe, and he led the D-Day invasion of Normandy and the push inland through France uh, and, and Belgium. And he was, um, as a foodie, he was very concerned about keeping his troops well fed, and he helped to develop the K rations and the C rations that the soldiers took into combat. And he would be right behind the front lines in his Jeep, and he would take... <laughs> He would take his K rations uh, when there was a break in the fighting. He would put them on the engine of his Jeep and warm them up. And then he'd use the hood of the Jeep as a picnic table and eat his food there. And, um, uh, you know, he, he went by Napoleon's dictum that an army runs on its stomach. And he felt that it was very important that his troops be well fed. And uh, this was a distinct advantage on the battlefield. And in fact, the Germans were not as well fed as the Americans. And so I thought that was kind of a fascinating backstory. When he uh, uh, after the war, he um, unexpectedly, for a West Point graduate, he is named the president of Columbia University in New York City, where I'm from. And uh, he was there for a couple of years, and the thing he was most famous for was a recipe. This is, you know, the head of an Ivy League college. And so he, um, the, when he first arrived, the students were putting together a cookbook. It was called something like, What's Cooking at Columbia? And they wrote the Eisenhowers and asked for a recipe. And I think they probably thought that Mamie would send in a, a cake recipe or something. Now, Mamie was not a cook. She said she was a dropout from cooking school uh, and she could prepare fudge. And that was about it. Uh, so Ike did the cooking at home. And when the students asked for a recipe, he provided them with um, an elaborate two page hand typed recipe for his mother's two day vegetable soup. Now, this is a fabulous dish, which I've made, and I recommend you all try it sometimes. It's, it's an epic dish. Uh, you start with a giant beef bone, which you have to cut into, get the butcher to cut it into so that the marrow comes out. You use both beef and chicken stock. Uh, you put vegetables in. You don't put them all at the same time because, as he says, you don't want them to come out mushy. Uh, you put some barley in there, and you literally cook this stuff down for two days, and then the whole house ends up smelling of a delicious beef aroma. Uh, he calls it a vegetable soup. It's really a beef soup. Uh, you put a little bit of diced beef in there at the end. 
And in a culinarian touch, he added diced nasturtiums at the end, which give it a little peppery flavor. So when this uh, recipe was printed by the students, it caused a national uproar. People couldn't believe that the president of Columbia University, a five-star general, was cooking like this. And it, the recipe was reprinted all across the country in the newspapers. And it was a phenomenon. It was really amazing. He gets to the White House, and uh, he became known as the president who cooks. Uh, he was incorrigible. He would go up to the roof and grill corn on the cob. Um, he was famous for Eisenhower's steak, which is um, you get high quality um, coals going, you burn them down until they're glowing, and then you, you don't even use the grill. You put the steak, uh, which has been uh, covered with olive oil and garlic, you put it directly into the coals. Um, and I've done this, and it's really good. And what it does is it sears the outside of the meat and leaves a nice pink interior. Uh, and people worry about the ash, but you just brush it off. It's not a problem. And I'll tell you that there are 10 presidential recipes in the back of the book. Uh, they're all designed to be pretty easy to make. Uh, each one has a little story behind it. And we have Eisenhower's steak as one of them. So try it out. It's really fun and easy. And it's a great uh, kind of crowd pleaser. And uh, the other thing that he did was he used food in the way that Jackie Kennedy used food. And Jackie Kennedy modeled her evenings on Louis XIV, the, the Sun King of, of France, who very intentionally used food and entertainment as a way to bring people together to basically keep his friends close and his enemies closer, um, and to make his palace, or in Jackie's or Ike's case, to make the White House the place to see and be seen, a kind of must-go-to place. So what Eisenhower did was, he, when he first got to the White House, he would invite cabinet members, members of Congress, generals uh, over for uh, quiet, off-the-record dinners. No journalists allowed. That He would invite 15 people at a time. He made everybody at the table speak up. And in this way, he gathered intelligence about what they were concerned about, what was happening. And these dinners became so popular that there was a big rivalry about who got invited, who didn't get invited. Word began to leak out that these dinners were happening at the White House every week, and people started clamoring for invitations. And so after he had gone through almost all of Congress, um, except for I think four guys never made it, um, he began to open the dinners up to people from across the country. So he'd invite industrialists, He'd invite sports stars, celebrities, um, uh, engineers, doctors, uh, journalists who were not allowed to write about it. And he would have these stag dinners. And he would do the same thing. He would gather intelligence from across the country about what people's concerns were. And it was really smart. And it worked really well. And it get, get, allowed him to keep his finger on the pulse of the nation. Then what happened was, um, first of all, the uh, Republican women felt put out because they weren't invited. So he had some breakfasts for the Republican women. Then what happened was that people either wanted their names mentioned or didn't want their names mentioned. If you didn't have your main name mentioned uh, and you had traveled across the country, you were put out because you wanted your friends to know you'd had dinner with the president, right? Um, but other people didn't want their names known uh, for their own reasons. And so there was this kind of moment where Ike had to decide what to do. And uh, he decided to keep it quiet as much as he could and just let people work it out for themselves. But it was a st strategy that he had used during the war with his generals. When he would get them together, everybody gave their opinion about what they should do uh, uh, during their campaign. And he would sort of meditate on this and come up with his own solution. And so it was a, a tried and true strategy. And then one of my favorite Ike stories was um, he had a heart attack towards the end of his uh, first term. And he had to decide whether to run again for reelection. His brother Milton was a doctor and advised him against it. He said, you know, you could retire now. You could be this eminence grise. You could, you could be the kind of the kingmaker of the Republican Party. You don't need to have all the stress of the, of the presidency. Um, and the doctors said, you know, it's not the big things that get you. It's the little things that make you so angry and your temper uh, uh, you know, this is really bad for your heart. Plus, he was smoking four packs a day. 
uh, you know, this was the uh, this was the fifties. Um, and he would eat steak at least twice a day. And sometimes he'd have a hamburger for lunch in the middle. Uh, so he he was a, he was a very fit, but he uh, had a red meat uh, and potatoes diet. Uh, smoked. Uh, he liked to have a drink. Uh, you know, he was a soldier. Um, and yet the the rest of his cabinet um, were very much in favor of him running again. And one of the big questions was. Who should his vice president be for, if he were to run, who would his vice president be for his second term? Now, as you may recall, his current vice president was Richard M. Nixon, um, with whom Ike did not get along with at all. Ike was kind of a moderate Republican. Uh, Nixon was a far-right conservative Republican from Orange County. Um, and, but Eisenhower had picked him as a kind of a, uh, as a diplomatic move to the, to the right wing of his own party, but they didn't get along at all. And they had nothing to do with each other socially. And Nixon, of course, was seething that he was not invited to the White House. He was not invited to the Gettysburg Farm that the Eisenhowers had built. And um, Mamie would always say things like, well, if we invite them over, we have nothing in common. They don't play bridge. Um, <laughs> and um, the Eisenhowers were fam famous for playing bridge all weekend long. They would get their friends over uh, from both parties. And as long as you like to bet and eat Chinese takeout, you were good to go. Um, Nixon's, the Nixons didn't play bridge. They didn't fly fish. Um, they didn't do a lot of the things that Eisenhower liked to do. But his, his options were limited for vice president. So he had this secret dinner with his cabinet trying to decide who would be his vice presidential running mate or if he were to run for a second term he kept the guest list top secret only he and his personal secretary knew who was on the list and then just before the dinner was meant to take place the the list was leaked to the press and this set off a furor because the public wanted to know who was in who was out what was happening why did they have this meeting um, why wasn't Vice President Nixon invited to the meeting, to the dinner? Um, and Eisenhower couldn't figure out who leaked this list. Um, he trusted his secretary. She was the only person other than he who knew about it. And in the middle of the night, he remembered he'd had a conversation with Nixon months before in which he would said, you know, I'm going to have a dinner with my cabinet and we're going to discuss running for the second term. And I'm not going to invite you because I don't want it to be awkward. And he had this flash of insight that Nixon was the only one who could have leaked the secret list uh, out of a fit of pique trying to destroy this dinner because he wasn't invited, which is kind of on brand for Nixon, right? And Ike figured this out and went ahead and had the dinner anyway. And they decided at the end of the day he would run for a second term and he had no choice but to include Nixon as his running mate. Um, so this is just one of these things where the dinner uh, becomes the fulcrum around which a lot of other stuff, a lot of political stuff happens. And this is one of the, this is the kind of story that I was looking for in the book. My criteria for including the presidents was number one, are they well known? Because I wanted to reach a wide audience. And number two, did they have a food story that was worth including? And Eisenhower had many food stories that were worth including. And I ended up deciding that he was actually the best presidential cook of all of them. The second best was Jimmy Carter, another farm boy, uh, who also liked to hunt and fish and would make big vegetable stews and, you know, country ham with red eye gravy and that kind of thing. Um, but Ike, Ike was not a gourmet, but he was a really good cook. So he made the list. And that's the end of that story. <laughs> I, I love the whole thread. I mean, who would have thought that you could get so much politics and action out of out of food um, in the White House? So the next president we've chosen is JFK, John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States. He was president from 1961 to 1963. Guess what? He liked ice cream and clam chowder. And I've learned from the book that it was really Jackie Kennedy who saw the power and the mystique of the state dinners. She even repainted the dark green walls of the state dining room into two colors of white to show off the beautiful craftsmanship of the White House that she was redecorating and refinishing. And she replaced 
which I found fascinating, the U-shaped tables and the E-shaped tables, the huge banquet tables with small circular tables so you could fit more people in and have more kind of electricity between small groups of people. Um, it's a fascinating chapter. And I'm just going to say my cousin who is here, Joan Claybrook, said to me, we were talking about Alex's book at my dinner table last night, irony. And um, she took the book and she started to read the chapter on JFK. And she looked up to me and she said, you know what? I lived through John F. Kennedy's administration. I actually went to the inauguration and I didn't know half this stuff. <laughs> and she also got out of doing the dishes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's talk about a little bit about um, Jack and Jackie. Sure. Um, yeah, they're one of my favorite chapters also. I mean, they're all good chapters, but uh, the Kennedys uh, hold a special place because of Jackie. And one of the themes that I try to bring out in the book is the role of the First Lady, which is often overlooked. Um, the First Lady's job is not paid, but it really is a full-time job. And it's a very important job. And it is a very political and politicized job, increasingly politicized. Some women love the role, like Mamie Eisenhower, love being First Lady. Others are more ambivalent, like Jackie Kennedy, who had a kind of a love-hate relationship with it. And then there are others, um, like Bess Truman or Melania Trump, who hated the job and kind of hid away for four years. Um, and I think the majority of women have a kind of ambivalent relationship with it, because it is an amazing fully pulpit to be the First Lady. You can, as, as Eleanor Roosevelt did, did you, during the Second World War, you can, uh, you can really communicate with the public and use your position to educate people. Um, and Eleanor spent a lot of time talking about how to eat healthily, but using uh, your victory garden or your food stamps um, and um, how to, how to, how to uh, kind of engineer your food to get the most calories out of it. But also it was about, in her case, it was about female empowerment too, uh, which is sort of a, a new theme uh, for the first lady. And that didn't sit well with a lot of people, but it was really kind of a revolutionary moment. Jackie Kennedy was a very different kind of first lady. She was beautiful. She was a Francophile. Uh, she had lived in Paris for a year. She had come from a lot of money. Uh, she had a very wealthy father-in-law in Joe Kennedy, who helped to underwrite her redesign of the White House, uh, or renovation, really. Um, she also had, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, ambitious social agenda, intentionally based on Louis XIV, the Sun King, and entertaining and fine food was central to her vision. So she hired a French chef named René Verdon, who, um, and I'll tell you a little side story. So I'm friends with Jacques Pepin because of through Julia, I've gotten to know Jacques very well. And um, it turns out that um, when they were looking for a White House chef, they approached Jacques and asked him to be the chef. And he had, in the meantime, he and Pierre Franey had accepted jobs working for Howard Johnson of the Howard Johnson's roadside diners. And he turned it down. He said, no, I've got this great job. I'm going to be making mass produced clam chowder. And, you know, <laughs> but they also were exper experimenting with dishes like Coquille Saint-Jacques, which is, uh, you know, a really classical French dish, which was then Americanized and, and turned into a roadside food. And, and but he said, my roommate, uh, René Verdon, is a very good chef. He works at the Essex House in New York. Why don't you talk to him? So they hire Verdon. Um, Verdon um, comes into the White House and starts producing a series of remarkable meals. And Jackie starts hosting these amazing dinner parties, some of which are state dinner parties, some of which are just um, parties for the sake of, of parties and to bring people together. Um, one of my favorites was called the Brains Dinner, not because they ate brains, but because they invited brains, the Nobel laureates. They invited 49 Nobel laureates. This had never been done before. Um, and the White House staff thought that this was going to be into a bunch of kind of fusty old academics. Well, lo and behold, uh, you had people like Linus Pauling, um, who had been out protesting um, the Vietnam War uh and nuclear testing in front of the white house the day of the party which annoyed jackie to no end 
Uh, and then you had people like Robert Frost and Pearl Buck uh, who were there. And you had this remarkable gathering of people. And the, the Nobel laureates ended up being uh, kind of high spirited and they had a few drinks and um, Jackie was trying to herd them into the East Room for the entertainment. And, and they decided that they didn't want to do that. And they started dancing around in the, in the entrance hall. <laughs> she finally got them in there. Um, another dinner was for Andre Malraux, who was the French cultural man, minister, um, had been a, a resistance uh, a hero and a fighter pilot during the war. Um, and at his dinner, uh, Kennedy had managed to bring Charles Lindbergh out of uh, hiding and you know he had been um, uh, a fascist sympathizer uh, his son had been kidnapped uh, and he had been he and his wife kind of hid out but somehow the White House found out where they were they invited Charles Lindbergh and Lindbergh walks into this dinner and people break into tears because he had been their childhood hero and he would kind of disappeared and there he was in the flesh and it was kind of a, a coup de théâtre you know a theatrical moment when Lindbergh walked in and at that dinner, uh, Jackie sat next to Mel Rowe, and, and they had this little whispered conversation in which she convinced him to loan the Mona Lisa to the United States. Uh, the first time the Mona Lisa had ever left France in 400 years, um, it was considered highly controversial in France and America. Um, and just getting the painting across the Atlantic safely took a whole bunch of work. It was built, it was put in a special case that would float in case the ocean liner sank. Uh, there were armed guards. Um, they brought the painting uh, to America. Uh, she arrived right in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they delayed the opening uh, because we were about to go to war. <laughs> uh, that was resolved. Uh, they open uh, the Mona Lisa at the National Gallery. Over a million people come, and it is this kind of remarkable cultural moment that by the way, paid amazing political dividends to the White House. Um, and it was at that dinner that Jackie had brokered this. Uh, and then there was a, a famous state dinner uh, uh, that she held, inspired by a meal that they had had at, in Versailles. Um, uh, they had been over talking with Charles de Gaulle, uh, who was a very independent-minded guy, uh, didn't want to be aligned with the US too closely, was kind of flirting with the Russians. Uh, wanted to develop France's own nuclear program. So Kennedy goes over there and he tries to convince uh, de Gaulle to tone down the anti-American rhetoric and to work with us. That did not go well. De Gaulle would have nothing to do with that. However, the First Lady was a complete um, uh, champion of France, knew more about French history and culture than many French people did, and was a very chic. And she became this star in the eyes of the French people. And they would chant, Jackie, Jackie, you know, they'd be driving through and, and the president said, yes, I'm the man who accompanied Jackie Kennedy to Paris and, <laughs> and I'm very lucky. And they were invited on their final night out to a, a dinner in at, at the Palace of Versailles and they held the dinner in the Hall of Mirrors, the famous refractory hallway, which many of you have probably seen. And then after dinner, there was this remarkable theatrical moment where they, they went to um, a, a recreated a theatrical piece, musical theatrical piece that had been design for Louis the 15th uh, and Jackie came out of this thing just buzzing and she was determined to do a similar magical evening uh, in the States and then the question became well, well who should we do a state dinner for and where well it turned out that General Ayub Khan the, the, the president of Pakistan was due for a state dinner now Pakistan was a very important ally still is uh, because of where it's located um, and the problem was that General Khan was annoyed with America because we had given a billion dollars in aid to his arch enemy, India, uh, and hadn't alerted him to that. And uh, so this dinner was kind of loaded politically or diplomatically. Um, and so it was a special dinner. And Jackie decided to do something that had never been done before, which is to have a state dinner outside of the White House and outside of the White House grounds. And in searching for a place, she decided to do it at Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate, just south of Washington, D.C., down the Potomac River, and another place like Monticello that I recommend you all go see. And the fact that a dinner had never been held there since 1926 didn't matter, nor the fact that it had a poor electrical system and very few bathrooms. 
the first lady had a vision and uh, as Letitia Baldridge, her social secretary recounted, uh, she had a, a sweet but steely demeanor. And she, she was said, it will be done. And so Rene Verdon, the chef, made a poulet chasseur dinner, which is a chicken and mushroom and tomato sauce, which was an homage to a, a Martha Washington dish. Um, he had to cook it at the White House and then truck it down to Mount Vernon. He had some outdoor stoves set up to reheat the dinner. Um, Zaki set up an, a, a beautiful yellow and blue tent on the lawn at Mount Vernon overlooking the Potomac um, uh, to accommodate 132 guests. There were the round tables that you mentioned. Um, the guests arrived by flotilla uh, from Washington, uh, including a PT boat like the one that Jack piloted during the, first, uh, the Second World War. Um, so it was kind of this dramatic mise-en-scene that she created. Um, and Letitia Baldridge talks about how the women were flitting across the lawn, uh, their earrings sparkling in the candlelight. Um, the fireflies came out to add a touch of surreal magic. Um, but right before the dinner, uh, they decided, they, they, they figured out that the outhouses, the, the porta potties had been set up in a, in a, in a patch of poison ivy. <laughs> so they had to move the, the outhouses and the men uh, moving the outhouses then got attacked by the mosquitoes who had their own state dinner. Uh, uh, and so they, so they started uh, wafting insecticide, a breeze kicked up and wafted that towards Verdun's dinner. Uh, Verdun had a freak out and threatened to quit and, quit and move back to Paris. Uh, and there was this kind of moment of crisis and Jackie, in her sweet and steely demeanor said, will be done. And sure enough, it was done. They pulled off the dinner. But then this uh, Cold War uh, intrigue reared its head, which is, uh, this is something that you need to know about state dinners. That state dinners are usually the culmination of weeks or months of uh, very intense diplomatic negotiating um, behind the scenes. And the state dinner is the culmination of this process. And it's kind of a moment of release, of celebration, uh, an exhale, if you will. And um, we had been negotiating behind the scenes with the Pakistanis. And right before dinner, Jack takes General Khan, just the two of them, on a little walk through George Washington's garden. And as I mentioned, Khan was annoyed with the US. And whatever Jack said, must have been very charming. Uh, and with Jackie's beautiful mise-en-scene, they somehow managed to seduce uh, General Khan because it turned out that he had uh, denied uh, the CIA, CIA the use of his secret air bases out of which they were flying over China trying to figure out what the Chinese nuclear program was. And he had cut us off from doing that. And as a result of this dinner, uh, suddenly the air bases became available. And so not only were we flying U-2 missions over China, but we were dropping insurgents into Tibet uh, to cause trouble there. And I love this kind of front of the room, back of the house thing that's happening uh, at this state dinner. This, there's always some sort of economic or diplomatic intrigue going on. Um, and, and this one was kind of, an, in a, a kind of extreme example where you have this beautiful dinner, this special place, uh, a, a state dinner that has never been done before or since, I will say. Um, and then this great diplomatic moment behind the scenes, which ended up paying off a year later, when in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, China invaded um, India, which most Americans are not even aware of, uh, and has resonance today with the tension between them uh, continuing and the great game being played out in Asia. And, um, the rapport that Khan and Kennedy developed that night really paid off a year later when, 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 the, when the invasion happened. And, and it was a kind of global crisis between uh, Cuba and, and, and China and India. So this is just an example of the kind of way that Jackie and Jack used food uh, to, uh, in a gastro-diplomatic way, as they say, uh, to build bridges and to bring people together and to uh, for their, their, their own political aims. So just one, we, we have, I want to open it up to questions, because I'm sure you have tons, but I did promise you one thing um, about why the uh, bicentennial dinner, state dinner, 
1976 for the Queen of England was such a disaster. <laughs> so I want to ask you about that. And then, with just in five minutes, to also tell us about Julia Childs, because there is a really interesting connection to Julia Child and the White House dinners. So maybe in five quick minutes, and we'll open it up for, for questions for everybody. Sure. So very briefly, Julia Child was my great aunt. Her husband, Paul, was the twin brother of my grandfather, Charlie Child, uh, who has a house on the other side of the island. And so Paul and Julia used to come and visit here. It wasn't their house, but we all gathered there and we made uh, blueberry pies and chowders together. And um, I grew up with Paul and Julia. They were um, members of the family, but I also knew them as, uh, I knew her as a celebrity chef. And um, I helped her write her memoir, My Life in France, and which inspired half the movie, Julie and Julia. And um, in the course of that book, I discovered, I knew that Julia had spent time at the White House, but I didn't realize quite how much. And it turns out she'd spent quite a lot of time at the White House. And there were two state dinners in particular that she made television documentaries out of. The first was in 1967 when LBJ hosted Prime Minister Sato of Japan, right in the middle of the Vietnam War. And she somehow convinced LBJ to allow her cameras to come in and film, and it was literally film, it wasn't video back then, black and white film, uh, film of what it looks like behind the scenes when the White House hosts a state dinner. Now, Paul and Julia had been diplomats in France and Germany and Norway, so they understood the diplomatic stakes, but of course they were also gourmets who understood the culinary aspect of a state dinner because they were kind of the perfect people to do this documentary. And um, it was a roaring success. Uh, Henry Holler, the chef who had served for the most uh, presidents, uh, he served five presidents, uh, cooked this wonderful meal. Um, and Julia's cameras were in the White House kitchen. Uh, they showed the, uh, the guests coming in in their gowns and tuxedos. You're not allowed to show the dinner itself, but they did a cutaways where they did a little tour of the White House. And this documentary, which is called White House Red Carpet, you can find it online uh, on pbs.org. I highly recommend it, it's very entertaining, um, was um, a, a kind of a phenomenon. It, 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 it showed people what the White House looked behind the scenes in a new way. Uh, it also uh, told Americans why state dinners are important and continue to be relevant and what they are. Uh, most Americans have heard of state dinners, but they don't know what they are. And uh, this, this TV show was a big success, and Julia took note of that. And then nine years later, in 1976, at the US Bicentennial, Gerald Ford uh, hosted, a, hosted a dinner for Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Um, and at this time, they had a big white tent over the Rose Garden, and um, everything was meticulously planned down to the last minute. Uh, Henry Holler was still the chef. He made a special meal. Um, Julia was there with uh, some commentators from the BBC. Um, it was the bicentennial, so it was an extra special thing. The other thing was that Gerald Ford was running for re-election um, against Jimmy Carter. And uh, so there was a lot of pressure on this dinner. Um, right before the dinner, a tremendous storm blew off the Potomac and rain came in, knocked down the TV cameras, soaked the lawn, soaked Julia's hairdo and everybody's dresses and tuxedos. And it was kind of a disastrous beginning to the evening. People had to go and change and they finally regrouped. They come back, uh, they have a dinner in the tent. Um, Julia and her crew are stuck in a little side room. They're, they're not allowed to taste the dinner. Uh, they're given soggy sandwiches and a little bit of water and she's <laughs> pining for just a glass of wine. Um, and they, they can't see the dinner. They're watching it on little monitors um and she's kind of grumbling about that the dinner continues to be damp uh the queen gives a boring speech bob hopes jokes fall flat uh when ford dances with the queen the marine band inadvertently strikes up the lady as a tramp uh, <laughs> not not realizing what they were playing and then the kicker is uh when LBJ hosted his dinner, he, he had Tony Bennett uh, singing his jazz hits, and that was a great, uh, great moment. Uh, but Ford chose to, because he was running for re-election, he was trying to have a populist touch. He had the captain and Tennille warbling about muskrat love, uh, which Julia deemed rather unqueenly. 
And uh, uh, so this dinner was kind of bumbling and mumbling. And at one point, the camera was pointed at a tree for no reason. It was kind of this crazy <laughs> quasi disaster. And yet, at the end of the day, it was the president and the queen uh, at the bicentennial. And how bad can that be? And Julia felt very lucky to be there. But what's important was these dinners got these global leaders together. They got to know each other as human beings rather than, than just as stick figures. And um, they, were, they had kind of the, the, the ripple effect. There was this, there's this resonance that comes out of these dinners that they're really important. As, as Nancy Reagan said, you can get a lot of work done at these dinners. And she's right, they're really important. And it's again, goes back to this notion of eating together. We humans not only like it, we need it. Um, and that's why I think state dinners are still relevant all these years later. The first state dinner, by the way, was uh, held in 1874 by U.S. Grant, uh, who he, he held a dinner for King Kalakaua of the Sandwich Islands, which we now call Hawaii, uh, and is now a state, but back then was an independent kingdom. Uh, and you go all the way up to, you know, now we just had uh, uh, Narendra Modi of India with a, with a vegetarian state dinner uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, which was a kind of a phenomenal event for, for different reasons. But um, Julia was inspired by the, the reception that these telecasts had. And so she took it upon herself uh, out of patriotic duty to amplify the meals at the White House and encourage first families not only to highlight the uh, chef Holler and his cooks, but uh, regional cuisine. And so when the Carters won that election and came in, she said, you know, you should really be doing Georgia cooking. And not only Georgia cooking, but what about New England cooking and Midwestern cooking and Alaskan cooking and Puerto Rican cooking and get, get this, you know, go bring America to the White House and celebrate the good in American food. And she, would, she wrote a couple of essays about this in the New York Times and she really became impassioned about this. So when I was working with her, I was not aware of this, and I discovered all this stuff in my research. And this was one of the inspirations for the book. Uh, I really um, was, was turned on by the notion of state dinners and all this, this publicity that Julia gave people like Chef Holler um, and the role of food at the White House. And I realized that food is eaten there every day, whether the president is there or not. And, and it's often front and center in the images you see, but we kind of take it for granted. And yet there's so much that kind of revolves around these meals. And I finally decided that a meal at the White House isn't simply just about nutrition. It's not fuel. It's a series of signs and symbols and stories that tell us uh, not only about the first families as human beings and their quirky tastes, uh, but also about the evolution of the nation, the industrialization and mechanization. You know, you look at George Washington starving at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777, foraging for mushrooms, uh, his troops about to lose the revolution because they were running out of food, all the way up through um, the days, as I mentioned, when it was squirrel stew and roasted possum, uh, to sort of space age, Sanka and Tang and uh, so Pop-Tarts, to uh, you know, modern day taco bowls and kale and, and performance enhancing ice cream. And that, that narrative arc uh, that you see through presidential menus tells you so much about the evolution of the nation and ultimately about ourselves as Americans. So that's so great. one of the ways I was inspired to write the book. So great. So I'm sorry we, 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 we kept going on, but I found so fascinating to hanging on every word. So, but we do want to open it up for questions. So anybody who would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Sean will come around with a uh, microphone and maybe we keep it short so we can yes, get sure. more. Sorry, sorry to go more on. In. No, no, it's fine. We're, we're on time. But. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you touched on it with the Modi State Dinner, but dietary concerns, preferences, and uh, considerations are, of course, ubiquitous these days. But throughout history, have there been a uh, occasions where uh, the state dinner served something to someone with a dietary concern that uh, they would have to say no and that, that uh, create an affront, and vice versa, would they serve something knowingly? <laughs> the person didn't. Like That's a great question. Uh, the answer is somewhat complicated because state dinners are very carefully orchestrated. Uh, 
for weeks beforehand, the State Department and the Social Secretary uh, and the White House Kitchen are in touch with the guests of honor and their people, and they figure out what for example, the Queen of England would like to eat or not like to eat. And so Henry Holler would say, oh, well, Prince Philip, he was an old Navy man. He'll eat anything. But the Queen didn't like sushi. So there was no sushi involved with that. Um, and they kind of worked out a menu ahead of time. Um, Narendra Modi is a vegetarian. Uh, and um, so that was a, a very carefully orchestrated dinner. Um, Generally, in a state dinner, the kitchen tries to prepare something with the best of American ingredients and technique, but with a hint of the guest country's cuisine. Uh, so when Gorbachev came, for example, the Reagan served wine from the Russian River Valley, uh, where a lot of Russians uh, settled, and um, you know, there was very good wine there. Um, so there's always a, a, a kind of a, an acknowledgment of the, of, the, of the guest country. So in the case of a state dinners, there was that not to my knowledge has there ever been anything that people wouldn't eat because it was so planned out, uh, nor has there been an insult dinner um, in that situation because this is all about building bridges, not walls, uh, and paying tribute. However, there have been some disastrous White House dinners. Um, one that comes to mind is uh, when George W. Bush, um, uh, he, he loved baseball. Uh, he was an owner of the Texas Rangers. He used to have little league games, and he would invite baseball greats to the White House uh, for these lunches. And at one of them, um, he was served uh, a sorrel soup with, uh, I believe it was poached uh, shrimp. Now, W was a meat and potatoes guy. He didn't like any slimy fish. He didn't like anything green. So he has these baseball guys like Yogi Berra there at lunch, and the first course comes out. It's a green soup with pink shrimp. And he takes one look at this, and he goes, what the heck is this? Something that washed up on the shore? And the waiters don't know what to do. He's, the president is clearly annoyed. So they quickly start taking the plates back into the kitchen. The guests are all kind of looking at each other in, in, in mystification. Uh, and the kitchen is panicking. And what, why is all the food coming back? Nobody's eating anything. And it turns out uh, they figured it out quickly. So they quickly made some veal uh, for the second course, and that calmed down uh, W. Uh, but that was a little bit embarrassing because, of course, it was made headlines. Um, and um, um, in terms of insult dinners, um, those have happened occasionally. I mean, one of the more recent cases is uh, Donald Trump, who liked to use food as a weapon. Um, and uh, you may recall that Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, uh, really wanted to be part of the Trump administration. Uh, and Trump liked to torture Christie in various ways. And he would often use food <laughs> as a way to do it. And Christie's a little heavy. He's a big eater. Uh, so Trump invites Christie to uh, Jean Georges, which is a, a restaurant in New York in one of the Trump hotels, uh, for a for a lunch. And he's he's teasing. Uh, Christie's kind of hinting that he might hire him for the administration. They sit down, a waiter comes over, and Trump says, oh, I got this. I'll order for us. I know this menu well. And he orders for Christie um, scallops uh, to start with and lamb for his entree. Well, it turns out that Christie is allergic to scallops, and if he eats them, he could die. Uh, and he doesn't like lamb. Uh, and so this was... Um, clearly a planned move by Trump. So Chris Christie doesn't get to eat lunch, uh, and, it was, and he was not hired in the administration. Uh, he was eventually given a, a kind of minor role years later, and now you see Christie running against Trump. Uh, and so uh, there was certainly uh, food being used as, a, as a, a political tool in a negative way in that case. So great. Do we, do we have time for another one? Yeah. yeah any why don't any we other questions? One more if there is one. One more if there is, and if not, we'll... Or any stories of anybody who's been yeah. to the White House. I have a feeling ah. in this crowd there have been some people who've gone to the White House. Since you are family to Julia Charles, did Meryl Streep give an adequate performance of your aunt? So um, I, they, they optioned the book that Julia and I wrote uh, for, this, for the screenplay, and I got to work with Nora Ephron, the director. I advised her on that, and I was able to coach Stanley Tucci in playing my granduncle, Paul. Uh, 
uh, and Stanley's still a friend, and he, in fact, he blurbed this book for me, which was very kind of him. That. And um, so I was part of the process of that. And I was also, got, I got to be an extra in the movie. Uh, but if you blink, you miss me. There's a scene <laughs> when Julia and her French friends go to the US embassy and Julia's sister, Dorothy, sees her future husband across the room. And when they walk into the room, which is supposed to be at the US embassy in Paris, but was actually shot in New York City. Um, I'm standing there in a 1940s suit drinking a fake martini and smoking a fake cigarette. Um, and I'm right by the door. And if you blink, I'm gone. Uh, but uh, the answer is I got to know Meryl Streep a little bit. Uh, and I got to witness her do that scene about 10 times in a row. And each time she did it slightly differently. It was so fascinating to watch her work and all the actors. And each one was slightly different. And I, I talked to her about it afterwards. And she said, well, I'm not playing the real Julia Child. I'm playing Julie Powell's um, fantasy of Julia. And so in the movie, Julia comes across as this kind of the good witch, the, the, this, this, this magical creature who can do no wrong um, and is barely human. She's so fabulous. And so I thought that was such an interesting insight that Julia wasn't trying, I mean, Meryl wasn't trying to emulate Julia. She was doing this fantasy version of Julia and she did that remarkably well. Uh, but if any of you have seen uh, the HBO Max series, which is called Julia, uh, which is sort of a fictionalized version of the story that I tell in my, my second book, which is called The French Chef in America, which is about when Julian Paul came back to the States and she became the first true celebrity chef. And it's the early days of television. There's a woman, a British actress named Sarah Lanchester, who plays Julia, who does a very different Julia, equally good, but in but a, more, a more kind of a Julia-centric way. And so it, it's fascinating to see these accomplished actresses playing somebody as subtle and nuanced as Julia was, because she was a complicated person, uh, seemingly simple, but actually quite complex. Um, and I'll just add, add at the end here that the Julia you saw on television was the real Julia that I knew in person, that you know she was very wise, very funny, slightly mischievous, mischievous, uh, always asking questions of people, uh, and you were never quite sure what she would do or say next. And, you know, if you watch her shows, which you can see online, they, they're still funny, they're still informative, and the recipes still work, and I encourage you to all do that. So great. Okay, I think that's... <laughs> Thank you. Merci and bon appétit. <laughs> Thank you both. That was that was excellent. We have Alex's book in the back that I'm guessing he might stick around for a little bit and sign copies. Next week, Sandra Uri is here. She is the former CEO of Cambridge Associates. We're going to be talking about sustainable investment portfolios with our own Joyce Cacho, who is a, a trustee of the college. And I encourage you to, to grab one of these. I know I have a lot to learn from this in terms of um, my own diplomatic kind of success that I need um, around food. And I will call my wife, what is it, Presidentress? Yeah. Yes, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm guessing she's not gonna like that very much, but I'll hear about it. Thank you both for coming. Yeah. And yeah, thank thanks everyone. Thank you all.